Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Evolving Solutions webinar uh, on mainframe and storage. Uh, we're going to be providing a little update on both of those platforms today. Uh, appreciate you all joining us today. Um, I'll mention it again, but uh, anyone and everyone's welcome to ask questions during the course of the webinar today. There's a Q&A window and you can feel free to pop anything in there. I'll do my best to uh, pass those questions along uh, to our guests today. Um, and I'm, today I'm joined by a couple of architects from Evolving Solutions to dive a little bit deeper into these couple of platforms. Um, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with Evolving Solutions, but I know that there are a couple from the registration list that may not be as familiar with us. So I just wanted to quickly touch base and let you know a little bit more about us. I'm Michael Downs. I'm the CTO for Evolving Solutions. Uh, we're a solutions provider that uh, focuses on helping our clients modernize and automate their business critical infrastructure in support of their business transformation. Um, I appreciate you joining us today. One of the things that we spend <clears throat> a lot of time speaking with our clients about is this idea of modern operations. And this actually was something that our clients brought to us a number of years ago as there were significant changes happening in the industry. Uh, one of the key challenges is ensuring that you have the capabilities to both support your existing environment as well as be able to support the innovation that you're making in the technology space. And being able to adopt uh, processes and tools and training that allows you to support the, both of those environments is sort of at the core of modern operations. Um, and I really think, honestly, that mainframe is a key part of, and mainframe and mainframe storage is a key part of modern operations. And that's one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to spend some time talking about today and why I invited uh, Roger and Jim to spend some time with us. And speaking of Roger and Jim, um, speaking today for with Evolving Solutions is uh, Jim Fife. He is the Z Systems Architect with Evolving Solutions. He's been here for four years after an extensive career at IBM helping clients around the world. Um, he is responsible for leading uh, the technical portion of our uh, Z Systems practice. Um, I'm also joined uh, by Roger Eklund. Uh, Roger has spent 25, over 25 years supporting and architecting mainframe storage environments. Uh, joined Evolving Solutions in 2019. We're extremely uh, happy to have him here working with us. He's worked with some of the largest mainframe clients in North America uh, in that environment. And I just mentioned he's worked with, since he's been here, had the opportunity to work with most of our mainframe clients in providing either architectural suggestions or uh, performance and capacity uh, studies with them. So um, part of what I wanted to have these two gentlemen talk about today and why I invited them here today is uh, some interesting innovations that are taking place um, that between IBM mainframe, uh, Z systems and IBM storage. There's some great synergy between these two platforms and you'll sometimes hear referred to as platform synergy. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to give uh, Jim the opportunity to share some information about some recent updates to the mainframe uh, portfolio. So, Jim. Thank you, Michael. And uh, first, I uh, say a hello to Mr. Bob Dot. I see him. He's logged in, one of several attendees. But, Bob, it's good to see your name on the short list. I trust life is good in Louisville, Kentucky. I've got some very fond memories of the Seelbach Hotel. It was a great, great experience supporting your account and I hope things are going well. Now there's a couple of items. I mean, maybe the first thing to talk about might be first the synergistic relationship between Big Blue, that which is in Poughkeepsie and which develops the iron, which is what we're looking at here and store it. You know, I, when I was with IBM, and I would take pride in the fact that Z, we own the IO architecture. And, um, and so we can, we, sh we certainly shape it. And there's a strong relationship between IB and Poughkeepsie and the storage division that results in innovation that is IO centric. So primitives like PAVs, Z high performance FICON, and even hyperlink technology that takes channel attachment and moves the service time from microsecond. That stuff's pretty innovative. And, you know, count key data devices, because that's what you connect to these bad boys, right? Not all vendors are created equal. There are, there's solutions out there. There's storage capabilities 
that aren't quite as mature fit they fit a, they fit a need all granted but don't have some of the foundational technologies like PAVs that we now Michael for your specific question on this chart we'll lead with Big blue term of technology crank again this year. They do a good job of doing it. In the lower right hand corner, we see in what's kind of a blue, you know, the Jim Five blue font, you know, um, the IBM Z15 TO2. That's a 19 inch rack mounted bad boy. That's the logical follow on to the ZR1. I'm proud to say that Evolving Solutions, we own a 3907, we own that guy. And I get the privilege of administering it. It's a great experience. And um, it's, it's, it's nice to have technology to work with. Now, as we look at this, we go back some number of generations. We go back to 2010, where the top row, for those that know this platform, those are the enterprise class machines, historically a proprietary frame and always a pair of frames. Two of these frames, if you somewhat can kind of look, there's like two frames between the N minus four, 196 and the Z14, the N minus one technology. And that's a de depiction of currency. Current technology, which was announced last September is 19 inch rack centric, the Z15 model T01. And um, it really built off of what was developed on the Z14 CR1, which we own. Some other items, when we look at the TO2, just because that's kind of the brand new shiny box from Big Blue, it's, um, it's for the small to medium business. So, and it's quite, it's quite a capable machine. When you look at, if you would use MIPS as the way to measure horsepower or capability, it's upwards of, um, you know, a 90 MIP uni, 98 MIP uni, you know, as, one, it's a, that's a kneecap server that can drive well up 1700 MIPS for a uni processor. And we know on that class machine, you can have up to six engines tied to MBS for the operating system. Some other pieces that are worth pointing out is over the years, you know, clock speed has made a nice steady improvement. And even where clock speed remains flat, like when you move from the Z14 ZR1 to the Z15 TO, TO2, the clock speed's the same. And yet clients moving from a ZR1 to a TO2, engine for engine, they're gonna see on average a 14% improvement in throughput capabilities, right? And it's, it's tied to the design and what the guy, you know? I'll probably close with this because I don't want to take up too much of Roger's time, but there's 65 engines that we can configure on the TO2 as an example, right? I told you six of those bad boys can be for the operating system like ZOS. The other ones could be specialty engines or certainly host Linux, very capable Linux box. It's even capable of hosting a Docker native co-located as an address space within ZOS with the right feature. Turn it back over to you, Michael. Maybe you've got some thoughts on the uh, security encryption capabilities between the two platforms. My, thanks, Jim. Um, for those of you who know Jim, he's both shy and retiring. Uh, he's not at all <laughs> passionate about the platform. So <laughs> we're super, uh, super privileged to have uh, Jim working at Evolving Solutions. Just I love the level of excitement that he brings to, uh, brings to the platform. Uh, Jim mentioned security, and I think one of the critical things in the, the mainframe platform has always been security. It's designed for having a secure environment. And uh, one of the things that I uh, wanted to highlight around the synergy between uh, System Z and the IBM storage platform is some recent updates to uh, the ability to do endpoint uh, fiber channel endpoint security on the IBM 8900 platform. So I'm going to let Roger dive into that quite a bit more deeply than I can. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks, Jim, also for uh, for kicking us off here today. Um, one thing I wanted to talk on, and I, I see Jim went through the history here uh, of the processors. I really don't have slides to go over the 8880s and, and the 8900s. I mean, they are, I feel, the, the best boxes, the best storage subsystems in the market today, along with replication and everything else. 
but what I really wanted to focus on here was the fiber channel endpoint security. Um, fiber channel endpoint security is really an extension of pervasive encryption, security, and data protection. Uh, the historical evolution began back in 2011 when IBM came out with the full disk encryption or FDE capable DS8Ks. Uh, this was with the introduction of the 8700 and 8800s. This provided encryption for data at rest. Many, but not all companies took advantage of this feature. Um, pervasive encryption really emerged on the scene when the IBM Z13 came out in early 2015. Um, pervasive encryption was slow to be adopt adopted, but had much interest. Uh, databases such as DB2, CICS were fairly easy to convert to pervasive encryption, but there was a 11 to 13 percent overhead hit on the Z13 to per, you know, to uh, to do the encryption and decryption. So in in mid 2017, IBM came out with the Z14, and one of its big features was a reduction in overhead for encryption, which reduced the overhead to two to three percent. So we really started to see a real push, and especially by the large banks, financial institutions. Um, and some other large companies. However, PE really did not cover all of your data. Um, so that brings us to the Z15 and especially the, the T01. IBM came out with that in September of 2019. This new box delivered zero overhead hit for pervasive encryption. And let's see, when the Z15 T01 is connected to the new DS8900s, it delivers fiber channel endpoint security. Fiber channel endpoint security consists of two categories. First is the endpoint authentication. This ensures business and customer data is accessed only by trusted servers and storage devices. Secondly, and most importantly, encryption of data in flight or EDIF. Your data is encrypted within and across data centers without application or operating system changes and without consuming host CPU cycles, regardless of your operating system, be it ZOS, ZVM, or even Z Linux. This means PPRC, Metro Mirror, Global Mirror, Metro Global Mirror customers, end to end security. Michael, next slide, please. The next slide illustrates how simple it is to enable and what is needed on your Z15 and your DS8900. On the Z side, you need to have the CPACF feature, endpoint security feature, along with some FICON Express 16 SE channel cards. By the way, CPACF is Central Processor Assist for Cryptographic Functions. It provides improved performance. And by the way, you can trust me on that. I Googled it, so I'm pretty sure that's correct. On the DS8 side, the key is the channel cards. They can be long wave, short wave, but they need to be 32 gigabit if you want both authentication and encryption. By the way, you do want that. Um, however, if you have the 16 gig cards, you can still enable authentication um, and you also need security key lifecycle managers, your SKLMs to be at version 3.0.1. Um, that's it, back to you, Michael. Awesome, thank you, appreciate it, Roger. Um, this is, uh, the security is obviously a critical piece of, of the mainframe and storage that IBM brings, but it's also a critical piece of modern operations. And to me, this is a good example of where uh, the capability that you build into the mainframe should integrate with the security that you're providing the rest of your enterprise. So the things that you do here on, the, on your mainframe environment or your mainframe storage environment are a critical component of how you deliver business transformation because as you're providing a level of security to that critical data uh, that otherwise wouldn't be required. 30 years ago, it lived inside of your walls and you didn't need it. Now it's being served um, by way of application platforms out to consumers that are outside of your four walls. And having this capability here is a critical element to being able to drive that transform transformation and drive that modernization. 
Um, another thing that I think we often think about when we talk about uh, mainframe and storage is being able to back up and recover that data that's so critical to making your business run. And uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask Jim to dive into a little bit more is a feature on the T02 called System Recovery Boost. And before he does, I'm just going to make comment again. If you've got any questions on any of this for Roger or for Jim, um, keep an eye on the Q&A here. So feel free to post anything if you'd like to dive into anything a little bit deeper. Uh, Jim, over to you, sir. All right, thanks, Michael. You know, just first a comment on the slide that Roger closed on. You noticed CPACF. That's, you know, that's a clear key engine, encryption engine, very high performance on the big iron. It exists on both the enterprise class machines and the business class machines. And I think those that know the platform know it's, it's, a, it's a no charge feature. It's turned off by default because the Department of Defense views it as a munition. So back in the day when we really didn't have a relationship with China or Russia, right? It would have to be turned off should the box find their way there. But you see a high performance encryption and hashing. There's also a secure key engine, they're crypto cards. We got a pair of those bad boys on our ZR1 that provides capability like SSL, TLS, handshake offload. That's a CPU uh, sponge type operation, similar to say calculating the molecular origin of the universe could be up there, you know. Um, <laughs> it also has secure P key encryption capability. And there's a lot of banking APIs that flow through both of those components by way of an operating system construct known as ICSF on Z, ZOS or Linux capabilities. Now, if we look to recovery boost, you know, you might ask yourself, you know, Jim, the ZR1 is a pretty good box, right? And there, the Z14, as Roger said, you know, Big Blue rewrote encryption capability in the Z13. And they rewrote it from the ground up on that class machine. I remember it because I was part of the announcement. Then they rewrote it again on the Z14 and really knocked it out of the park performance wise. And then they it made incremental enhancements on the Z15. Well, why would I consider the T01 or the T02? I mean, isn't the Z14 good enough after all? And this is an example of a capability that exists on the T01 and the T02. It's known as system recovery boost, and it's effectively a no charge capability should you have the right iron on the floor, Z15 based, and you've got the right maintenance on the operating system. Now, what we have here is uh, what I want you to do is first pay attention to what's really the red line, right? When you think about your environment, think about an LPAR. Let's say, you want to do a rolling IPL to inject a change either to the BCP or middleware, or maybe stuff gets in the ditch and you got to bounce the guy, right? Because it takes a hit, right? That's the left side of the chart. And the point is there's an event that's going to trigger an operator action. And without recovery boost in red, whatever horsepower you've got allocated to that LPAR, and that's general purpose engines, right? At whatever speed, go through a shutdown procedure, operations knows it, to shut stuff down. It's usually considered good form to not do a reset normal against the LPAR, right? You want to try to bring things down gracefully. That drives you down to point two. Then between two and three, right, that's where operations you're either strand them because it's a problem, right? Or you're, um, or you're just basically making some type of configuration change, and then you'll find your way back to the HMC, do a load against the LPAR with the light load part, right? Correct load parts, right? That initiates the restart. And for those that know that it's kind of watched MBS over the decades, when you watch the messages up on glass, you get those early knit messages where there's not too much intelligence loaded, you know. You see the councils come alive, Comcast initializes and councils get some personality, right? So ZOS is effectively up. Then all those core subsystems come up, like the resolver, right? Like you get the start for Jez, right? Things start to start breathing, right? And then the middleware comes up. 
And then all the while, right, stuff sits on the queues, clients are waiting to hit the enter key, middleware's up and you can, you can basically process work and it's a backlog. Well, what system recovery boost will do is when you're, when you want to bring an image down, it, there's no magic. You'll put in some maintenance, you'll start a proc as part of your shutdown. And the proc is gonna basically say, look, the, uh, whatever speed those engines are, and think for a moment if it's a TO2, in all those capacity settings, 150 plus capacity settings from A to Z, right? You can have a little A01, little kneecap guy, humming along at 98 MIPS, that bad boy just grew to a 700, 1,760 MIP uni to drive the workload down, right? And if you happen to have any zip engines, those are those specialty guys for like DRDA or IPsec, that kind of stuff, you know? Those guys can even run general purpose work. So we can drive the image down a lot faster. That's the green line. You still got to go through that, what do we want to accomplish? But two kind of plays into GDPS, which is some automation technology. The latest release of GDPS has an update to its verbs that drive higher levels of parallelism, which is kind of nice, right? The control LPARs deal with that. And then the folks that know that know what that LPAR is, right? Then you start the restart, right? You kind of initiate the restart. And now MVS isn't running on an AO1. You might have an AO3, who knows what you have. The point is those bad boys are running at full speed plus the zips. So the operating system reload goes faster. The subsystems that we know and love come up a lot faster. The middleware comes up faster, right? And then notice how the green line kind of goes up. This is one of the few times when IBM is going to give away MIPS to you, right? Because basically, your MVS engines are full speed, your zips are running at full speed, and it's driving down the JES2 input queue. And when Kix comes up and DB2 and all the mass of TSO users come in and flood you, right? It can absorb that rush of work for 60 minutes. That's what's happening here. And that only exists on the TO1 and the TO2. That's some real net value add. So, Maybe a bit belated, Michael, but I hope I hope it kind of gets the point across. You know, so that's that's fantastic. I, I, just fascinating the way that I think IBM sort of continues to take advantage of the platform um, in ways that nece didn't weren't necessarily obvious before. I mean, if you think about zips, they were created originally to optimize the usage for particular workloads, right? Um, and now it's being able cool. to take advantage of those though that capability to add new value to me that that's really interesting and innovative um, it really is and it's, it's some of the best minds out of poughkeepsie dave sermon and the guys writing this stuff and it kind of goes back to the synergy you know what this discussion is all about i mean big group designs the iron and they own the operating system that sits on top of it and some of the key metalwork right yep so absolutely. i agree with you and i mean i think this is also a good example of the way digital transformation has changed IT. Um, yeah, we never wanted the box to be down, but now it becomes even more critical for to get back to steady state as quickly as possible to be able to continue to serve clients and high value users in a different way, uh, but had different expectations. And a lot of, when we talk about that, a lot of times we end up talking about cloud um, and everyone talks thinks of public cloud as a key piece of, of modern operations. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, IBM's done some very interesting things to take advantage of public cloud, even around the Z and the storage platform. And one of the things I wanted to have uh, Roger dig into a little bit more is this uh, capability in the IBM platform called transparent cloud tiering. So Roger, I'll let you uh, take over here. Thanks, Michael. Hey. You know, I'm going to go off script just a little bit here. Just uh, you guys were talking about the uptime and the system recovery, and it just got me thinking. Uh, by the way, for for the rest of the audience, I I've been on the customer side for for over 30 years, and uh, it was a really proud moment after we had uh, clearly uh, IBM processors, but we had done a migration to IBM Disk, 
and we put in GDPS and Metro Global Mirror. And after a few years of having hyperswap and high availability, it was a really proud moment when our CTO was talking to a, to a huge audience and he's going, he, he made a mention that the mainframe is no longer five nines. And, you know, there, there's people that really support the mainframe and there's some people that always think it should be on a different platform. And it was almost kind of, he, he set up, set up, set that up, I think. And uh, some people are like, oh my gosh, what's he gonna say? And he goes, no, the mainframe is clearly 100%. <laughs> um, because even though there was a couple of unplanned hyper swaps, the availability was always 100%. So we never had any, any big failures. Um, if anything did happen, data was always available. Our customers were always being served. And that is, that's deals with the, the innovation of IBM, the synergies between the two platforms, being able to have the processors that are so tightly integrated with the storage. And it really takes it to a, to another level. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad we're sitting here and we're, we're gonna revisit here, uh, transparent cloud tiering. This is something that is unique to IBM. Um, I also wanna mention the, the fiber channel endpoint security that we first talked on, that is unique to IBM as well. So it, it's one of those things that, you know, data protection, literally protecting your data is everybody's main concern. I mean, you, you can't have your data, your customer's data being exposed. And this is something that's unique to IBM. They've just, again, taken it to the next level. Um, that brings me to transparent cloud tiering. And this is something that, again, is unique to IBM. And, um, you know, TCT or transparent cloud tiering is really cool, right? I mean, who doesn't want to be part of this movement to the cloud? Um, some would say it's kind of sexy. So <laughs> the problem is many people do not understand what it means and how it works. So let's see, you can set up TCT from your DS8880 or 8900 to the IBM cloud ICOS on-prem or off-prem. Or you can set it up so it, it writes out to Amazon S3 off-prem as a service or to your TS7700, which can be partitioned with a partition being cloud object storage and the other partition being your virtual tape as it is today. Thanks, Michael. Sorry. Um, many customers realize, well, no, that, that's fine. Next slide, please, thanks. Um, you know, we've gone through and done analysis for different customers and after analyzing their, their, their tape environments, they found a lot of unreferenced old tape data sets, many times not being used for one, two, maybe even three years or more. In those environments, um, they find that these candidates are, are super good to be able to move off to ICAUSE where they'll stay there until they expire. Unfortunately, you have to read all of these tapes back into your system and then they have to, um, well, and then they're moved out to the cloud. It's a one-time exercise. Some customers wait until they migrate to a new tape system to accomplish this during a migration. Um, by the way, this does, does go back in through your system. So there is MIPS involved, but the savings long-term is still well worth it, even if you're not migrating to a new system. So um, the other use of TCT is the most intriguing to me and that is partitioning your TS7700 as a cloud object store. Um, IBM has stated for a while that DFSMS HSM wants out of the business of physical data movement. Most customers have HSM set up to perform tasks of primary and secondary space management, migrating data off of their physical disk or virtual tape and um, Let's see, so everything is migrated off to, to free up more space really on, on your physical disk. Um, DFHSM manages the data movement. Data sets are stacked on virtual tapes. As data sets expire or are recalled, the use of those tapes require recycling. All of these actions require host activity. They burn valuable CPU cycles. So with TCT, 
HSM will migrate the data sets directly to the 7700 object store from your DS8K, never being read through your IBM Z. So each data set is its own object. I think that's really the key part right here. So the advantages of TCT is integration. It's a seamless integration into DFS, MES, HSM, and DSS. Supports obviously off-prem and on-prem store object storage, and now the TS7700 virtual tape. The other I big think, thing, what's that? I think, I think this is really fascinating. I, the, um, there are obviously the cloud storage in general is a topic that public cloud-wise, many of our clients want to talk to us about. Um, I don't know if you noticed on one of our earlier slides when we are talking about modern operations, uh, we always talk about cloud is, uh, it's not a place, it's a set of disciplines. And I think this is another great way of understanding that is you can take advantage of something like an IBM cloud object storage or, uh, or another S3 cloud repos S3 repository uh, to be able to integrate uh, and drive this added value, uh, regardless of whether it's in public cloud, on private cloud, um, and it's really, again, I think very innovative approach that the IBM team has taken to taking advantage of real uh, capabilities of cloud, not just a physical location, but what's been offered, what's innovative that um, that they can pull into the mainframe and the mainframe storage space to be able to do some uh, provide some additional capability. Um, We've got a little bit more time, and I know there's a topic that Roger is particularly passionate about, and I assured him that if we had time, he could dig in a little bit deeper into uh, into this capability that's uh, available in uh, in the DS platform as well called thin provisioning. And I'll let you uh, dig into that a little bit. Okay. Um, well, one of the things, actually, if, if you don't mind, there's a few other things as far as some of the Z synergies that I'd, that I'd like to touch on if we still have a few minutes for that. Please go ahead. Um, I know Jim and I had both talked about some of these other things and we we wanted to be respectful of everybody's time. And, you know, the, the, the things that stand out to me and Jim mentioned this earlier was ZHPF, which is a high performance FICON. IBM has done more, more advancements in that. So for extended distances, um, when we go through DISMAGIC studies, it, it's really amazing when all of a sudden you you see if a customer has the HPF turned on or not, and the difference it makes, uh, you know, it it it's really dramatic. So that's a big advancement. Um, Z HyperWrite. Um, this is something IBM came out with quite a while ago, and it's it's for customers that have PPRC or Metro Mirror, and it, the the host will write simultaneously both to your primary and your secondary disk in a Metro Mirror environment. Um, when I implemented this before, we saw close to a 30% reduction in DB2 log writes. Now, IBM has expanded it now, so it goes beyond DB2. It's MQ and IMS, and those those uh, all of them are seeing massive reductions. Um, in, in their log rights. When we went through and upgraded our network and moved to everything to be 16 gig throughout, we saw another big reduction. So so all those things are, are taken into effect, but Z HyperWrite was something really big. Um, I'll just touch on Z HyperLink just a little bit. Jim's got a lot of experience with that and has done different studies for it. But again, it's, it's IBM uh, delivering the, the low, latency for for your reads and this is really um for for db2 traffic and now they're starting to to bring it into other areas as well and uh one more thing as far as the synergy is like easy tier application this is something where when db2 reorgs are going on and let's say people a lot of customers still have either hybrid boxes or multiple tiers of flash when a DB2 reorg is going on and you have easy to your application, your hot extents, when they're being reorged, when they're being written back out to the disk, they will be put in your in your highest performing flash as a as a default. And, and that makes a big difference instead of it being written to your lowest tier and then have easy tier move that data and those hot extents back up. 
So that's a, that's a big thing. So Jim, what do you see for other synergies, please? Uh, I, I, a couple of things, you know, the hyperlink, Z hyperlink, right? Let's pick up on that a bit. You know, you know that attaches to your storage from my box, right? It's a channel uh, attachment. It's a feature code that you order on the Z14 and above that is deep he was a strong first player and kind of changes the IO paradigm. And I had talked about that a bit in my opening. And uh, so it's reinforcing what you stated. But I also want to mention, you had mentioned you can do just magic studies, right? Which are good for clients to help kind of look at the current environment, assess current performance, where there might be some hot spots, and, you know, make recommendations. It takes his input SMF data. For those that know the platform, know what that is. I can do the same thing for the server. And what's really cool is one of the tools, when we, we would use our mainframe to reduce your SMF data. We've got tooling made available from IBM. Thank you very much. It's unique to the business partner space. One of them is called ZBNA. It's actually a pretty cool tool set. Well, we can identify, we can look at the IO activity within a peak period. Look at the data sets that are open. I can tell you which ones are hyperlink candidates. I can tell you which ones are, pervasive encryption candidates. And we even had the ability to measure your rollout. So, and those are studies that are done pro bono, right? We'd happy, be happy to do that. So there's, you know, there's the, the two, the, the server and the storage have technologies that complement each other. There's tooling made available from IBM to us as a business partner, along with the mainframe we've invested in to help you understand what is the value of this technology to us. You know, another item I might talk about, we've got a little more time, is, you know, there's a there's an EDC card. We got one of those bad boys on our ZR1. It, and it has a complementary runtime in the operating system, but it basically takes that GZIP, right? You know, that compression algorithm you'll see on Windows boxes. That's a pervasive industry standard that works really, really good. But you guys, that thing's been around for a really long time on servers, the mainframe servers. It works great. Customers love it. One of the firms you used to work for, Roger, back in the day, they would use it as a way to like reduce their MSU consumption. Just like MIPS is a measure of like horsepower, MSU is a measure of how big of a check you write to Big Blue at the end of the month for software, you know? So they look for ways to reduce it, right? Well, on the Z15, they took the card concept, they baked that into the chip, the processor chip, right? And there's basically a new execution unit that does it. And the beauty of it is it's extremely highly scalable, far more than the card. The card was great, don't get me wrong. You could have 16 cards on a box, but you can only kind of fill it to 50% capacity because on the mainframe, we care about HA, you know, high availability. And Murphy is alive and well living in data centers. So stuff can fail, you know? Well, on the on the brand new shiny box, the TO1, TO2, they blew that away, man. It's highly scalable, tied to the chip. And so it's a nice example of taking a base technology, making it even better, and then extending to the business part of the tooling that we need to help you as a client understand what does this mean in English to us? How does it improve our TI posture? or technology investment posture. So that's that's kind of my two cents, right? Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Say, Jim, you, you were mentioning about the ZDC cards, and uh, I, I'm trying to remember what exactly IBM said as far as uh, the compression and whatnot that you would see. But uh, I know from the customer side, and Jim, earlier you had mentioned about SMF data, uh, we used to route everything for SMF in through the ZDC cards, and we were seeing compression ratios up to 10 to 1. So that, that, that's just a, another savings. If your data is compressed, it's going to run faster, utilize less space, all, all great things. Um, let's see, I, I did want to touch on thin provisioning here just a little bit. I, I know our time's getting getting down there a little bit. Um, you know, earlier I had talked about Metro Mirror and Global Mirror and Metro Global Mirror, and a, a real big concept that came out and, and really um, saved customers a lot of money is thin provisioning concepts 
and being able to have global mirror intact while they did DR exercises. And, but it was in the beginning, it was, it was costly because you needed three full copies of your disc at your DR site. One for your global mirror target, one for your global mirror journals, and one for your DR copy. Well, with the use of thin provisioning, you can reduce that now to three physical copies, or excuse me, two physical copies, but three logical copies, which is a which is a great thing. So, what uh, what I have implemented um, in, in the past here is thin provisioning on on the source box because there there's lots of different things that that can be done. Um, I've in, encouraged other customers to introduce larger model types. Um, perhaps they don't have the capacity for initially, and they're migrating from, from a different storage technology to the brand new 8900s. And with thin provisioning, let's say they want to add more Mod 54s, but they don't have the capacity. Or maybe they want to move into the new EAVs, and which is anything above a Mod 54, actually. And they don't want to purchase all that extra capacity up front. What they can do is thinly provision these volumes, and it only ties up 21 cylinders per volume, which is really a cool concept. I mean, these volumes are defined to your storage unit as, you know, it could be 262,000 cylinders, but until you actually write data to it, it only ties up 21 cylinders, which is a beautiful thing, especially, you know, especially for a storage guy. And, <laughs> You know, Roger, I mean, there's look at this stuff, right? This is really, this is another example of synergy between the operating system ZOS and the storage subsystem. And, you know, back, and this, these are for the big shops, right? That, that bump up against device number constraints. And, you know, the 3390 architecture is, has evolved from mod ones to threes to nines to 27, right? which is what you're hitting on and you the emv i call it a bmv like a big mother volume you know because it's a lot of cylinders you know and we have a couple of those bad boys to find on our dsak that we have tied to the bpic but it's another very good example and you've developed you know you're you can define an eav with only 21 cylinders because shops probably have a lot of small mod threes mod nines that they got to basically do device folding this is great technology to let them do that to then free up device numbers for growth. So very interesting. You know what, Jim, uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that too, because a lot of people think it is only for the big customers, but it, you know, quite frankly, what's true is that the smaller customers who don't have a lot of extra capacity, because a lot of mainframe shops run at that 65 to 70, maybe 75% capacity. So if you're a small shop, that doesn't leave you a lot of extra space to play, let's say, with the thinly provisioned volumes. So, you know, I have a couple of the smaller customers that wanted to add more Mod 54s into their shop and migrate their DB2 environment to Mod 54s because they were all on Mod 9s or Mod 27s. So what they do, they define these Mod 54s and then they just keep track of what their actual allocation is. They go ahead and initialize the volume, they add it to a storage group, and then they disnew their old smaller type volumes, and then they go through a DB2 reorg, and voila, they start to populate these larger volumes. So the migration to the Mod 54, which they didn't have the actual, if everything was fully provisioned, they didn't have that backend capacity. So after they empty off the smaller volumes, it's easy to do a space release, and then they just initialize that volume as something not to use in the future, so they never become over-provisioned. So it's it's a way for a smaller customer to be able to, to go through this and move to a larger model type. For the large customers, same thing, but, uh, but many times in just a, a larger extent. So no pain. You know, Roger, I tell you, man, it's nice to have you on the payroll because you've been around the block a few times when it comes to storage administration, you know? 
It's it's really kind of nice. You get bring some good experience to the firm, which is great. Benefits the clients we support too. Thanks, Jim. But yeah, it's this part's been really fun being able to work with a variety of clients, bring some of these things that uh, you know maybe a larger shop has taken for granted. But you know, it's all about exposures, and you get to be able to do these things and and bring a lot of these different disciplines across and. Uh, and, and people moving forward and being able to take advantage of, of some of this is, is, is really great and it's very eye-opening. Now, I, I know that you had touched on this before and before we run out of time, I just wanted to mention that, that we at Evolving Solutions are more than happy to help a customer and their, uh, with their performance, capacity planning, sizing of their disk, flash storage, uh, TCT and or virtual tape systems. And it's something that, uh, that you know, I, I really think brings a, a lot of value and a lot of people are, are surprised at how they're currently running. And uh, when they start taking a look at that, they know that it's time to bring in something new, that, um, that there is some help that is needed. And, uh, and we're more than happy to provide that service. Awesome. You know, I'll add to that. We've obviously got, we've got server capacity planning. Not a, that's no problems, man. We've also launched an enterprise COBOL 4.2 to 6.2 migration assessment practice. That's kind of cool, kind of partnering with a client out in the Wisconsin area on that. Basically, you know, for those that kind of follow the COBOL, COBOL's everywhere, runs our economy, right? Not going anywhere soon. When you go from 4.2 to 6.2, even though I, Big Blue kicked the support can down the, the, the road a bit, right? The end of service, end of support can down the road a bit further due to COVID. You know, there's the there's a there's a data an invalid data exposure when you go from four two to six two. We've got a practice, uh, an offering that allows you to understand when your code base what that exposure is, what's the cost to fix it, right? The other item we have, we got we're working with a firm here on the. I, I mean, I moved to Arizona, which is kind of nice. A lot of sun here now. It's kind of cool, you know. And there's a firm we're working with that uh, they want their they got to get their platform well. They're kind of on a little tired BCP. Looking at us to get them currents. We've got a path to currency offering that I developed, piloted, first of a kind, worked like a champ, 11 month migration, customer happy. But we do uh, code uh, ref platform refreshes, both hardware and the OS, middleware, and, and the cutover migration. Those lovely cutover weekends, which those on the system side know what that means, man, you know? So it's fun being on the channel, channel side. And the owner's pretty cool too. It's a nice guy. I swear I didn't script that last part. So uh. <laughs> oh, that's totally the have lived Jeff White, believe me. You know? Yeah. But, uh, we uh, anyway, I, I I'll hand it over to you, Mike, before I get in trouble. But anyway. <laughs> no, I do think uh it's a great place to work. Uh we're really privileged uh, to to be able to work with our clients in a way that is flexible and that you know allows us to bring the most value that we can to our clients. So um Thank you everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're doing a set of these and, and we're going to continue in the next couple of weeks. Next week, uh, Ted Latovsky, who's an enterprise architect for us, and I are going to talk about data protection, which sounds boring, uh, but uh, we are going to dive into some very interesting innovations around the way that uh, the way that uh, workflows have changed with uh, modern application structures and how that impacts data protection. And Ted's got some very interesting insights around that. So I'm really looking forward to that next week. And I uh, just want to say thank you all for joining today. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Have a great afternoon.